Um, I made some notes so I wouldn't forget what that I wanted to speak with you about. Um, so what were we fighting for? Um, we were fighting for PEIA, which is the Public Employees Insurance Agency that all West Virginia public employees are covered under. Um, there is no other option unless your spouse has um, an opportunity to take on something else. They don't work for, for the state of West Virginia. And we were also um, fighting for a salary increase for all public employees. Um, and, th and that would be, you know, our cooks, our bus drivers, um, our state road workers, our DHHR workers, everyone. And um, the reason that it became so dire that we fought for this um, was because that over the past several years, our health care costs have ballooned. And our pay, we get yearly salary increases, but they've been so minimal that they haven't even kept up with inflation, let alone the rising health care costs. So we really have taken a pay cut for the last three years. So PEIA um, has a board that is, uh, the governor says who's on it. And the main guy, his name is Ted Cheatham, and he makes like $144,000 a year. And so every year, PEIA in like October rolls out how that they're going to get their money for the next year, how they're going to meet their budget. Our state legislature, um, by code, covers 80% of the cost that goes into PEIA up front, and then the employees are supposed to cover um, 20%. And our legislature hadn't been funding it to the way that there was um, money in there that could cover the rising ballooning cost. So when they rolled out their new way of getting their money, they um, cut down the tiers so the people that were making the most money were actually going to start paying less for their health care costs, and the people that were at the bottom were going to be bumped up to pay more. And it was going to be based upon your household income, not just um, a set fee or based upon the primary's income. And they would even take into account your children that you had working in the home. So if you had a kid that had a side job at a gas station, <coughs> they would take that into account as well. And I think, um, not, not that that wasn't you know, bad enough, and your premiums were gonna go up several hundred dollars a month, and your co-pays were gonna go up, and your medication costs were gonna go up, but on top of that, they decided they were gonna do this program called Go365, Go365. And it was a punitive program. Basically, you had to like document your steps and your weight, and. Um, if you had chronic illnesses and things like that, and if you didn't meet a certain quota, a certain criteria of participation, they would kind of fine you with an extra $500 a year. But you, but hey, hey, you could get gift cards to Amazon if you worked really hard. Um, <laughs> so it was very much like dangling treats in front of us and expecting us to do tricks. Um, <laughs> So that, that, was, that was the reason. That was, that was what we were fighting for, was to make sure that people could afford their health care, could take care of themselves, and could continue serving the state, and that they could actually get a salary that would get them out of having to go to food banks at the end of the month. Um, so how did we organize to fight for it? Um, this was completely rank and file, ground up driven. Our unions did not say anything, really, until that it was late in the game. Um, I, myself, um, I did not create the Facebook group, but I am a moderator of it. We have a, a private, a secret, <laughs> Facebook group um, called West Virginia Public Employees United. In September of this just past year, there might have been 30 people on it. And then when the word started getting out about PEIA and how bad it was, the numbers just exploded. Um, we have about 20,000 teachers in West Virginia. We have a very small population. There's about 1.8 million in the entire state of West Virginia. And um, that went from 30 people to 400 to 1,500 to now 24,000. And people use this platform to share not only their anger and frustration, but their action. So if they decided that they were going to ask their members in the school, or, and, and non-members as well, and across organizational lines, to wear red on Friday, they would take pictures and post it. And so other people would say, hey, they did it, we can do it. Or they would have informational pickets, or we would have town halls where we would invite our legislators. So this secret Facebook group was the means to share all of this action. 
and to become inspired. And um, not only to share it there, where that you were only reaching people within there, but we encourage people, hey, if you, if you like something, take a screenshot of it. Just be thoughtful and take the name off of it if they don't feel comfortable with that and share it on your own page. Talk about it with your local association. So our organization online translated into working outside, alongside, and inside our associations. And we made sure to reach across, because in West Virginia, we don't have bargaining rights. And um, it's supposedly illegal to strike. And um, you can be a member or not, it doesn't matter, of either WVEA, which is under NEA, AFTWV, which is under AFT, or something called the WVSSPA, West Virginia State Service Personnel Association. So we reached out across those lines. Before, they were just competing for membership. And we said, you know, your issues are our issues. How, how can we work together to make sure that we're heard and not ignored? Um, the next question is, um, what role did the local and state unions play? At first, not much. Um, we, we organized on our own. We became mad. And, and we actually looked back through the group and we found out that on January the 6th was the first time that somebody mentioned strike publicly. And it was, uh, I can't even remember her name, it was, just, it was a teacher from somewhere in the state, and she said, I think it's about damn time we strike. And everybody was like, oh yeah, it is. <laughs> but with saying that, whenever that people went back to their locals, the unions were a part of it. In my county, I'm, I'm in southern West Virginia, I'm on the border of Virginia. If you've ever heard of the Virginia Tech Hokies, I'm about an hour from there. Um, you can drive five minutes and be in across the, board, the Virginia border. But we have a very strong structure in place. We have officers, we have building reps, we have monthly meetings. So we took what we saw online and brought it back to our union and said, we need to be doing this. How are we going to make this happen? And so it was basically just pushing, which is our job, the union in the direction that we want. You know, we, we are the union. We are the union bosses. It's not up to them to tell us what to do. We tell them what to do. They serve us. And eventually, um, the unions got on board and said, well, I guess we're going to have to start working with the other associations as well. And so they had, um, we took a vote as an entire state, as all people, all teachers and service professionals working in the building across lines, we voted on to walk out. And everyone had a voice, and everyone was important, and non-members were included as well because they're part of it. And, you know, you need them on the line, too, and if they decide to join your organization, great, but if they're being active and alongside you, then that's wonderful, too. And we took the vote. The union counted it. Um, they met together, and they said, we have, you know, the, the percentage we need to authorize it. And they publicly said that out. If you don't get yourselves together talking about our state legislature, then we're going to walk on these days. So they became, you know, not the only voice, but they became, you know, our voice. They started speaking uh, for the most part and, and what we wanted them to say. Uh, the next question is, what did you win and what did you, what did you not? Um, we won a 5% across the board for all public employees raise which is something we really pushed. Our governor, Governor Jim Justice, is the wealthiest person in West Virginia. And uh, yeah, that always how it works. <laughs> and uh, he, he, in his State of the State address, he said, I, I think this year we can give you a 1% raise. And everybody's like, boo, hiss. We've already, we're already upset about PEIA. You're just you know, encouraging us further to be even more ticked off. So, um, you know, initially they're offering small, which 5% is nothing. When you're making $40,000 a year after you've been working for 10 years, it's nothing. Um, and, uh, and even more so, and this is just an important note, because I think sometimes we forget how important that service personnel are. A starting head cook in a neighboring county, the person that's responsible for feeding our children makes $19,000 a year. You, that is, that's not okay, and that's not any way to live. I digress. So our union um, somehow made this deal 
with um, that we were just we were going to go back on good faith and we were going to accept a smaller percentage and that's when that we said absolutely not and we had that power because not only of the anger but of the communication you know we, we were using every platform possible to say you know we are the ones that are making the decisions and so we didn't go back and even though something that we didn't get was a permanent already in the books fixed to PEIA we did get the 5% raise for all public employees, which is incredibly important. If you alienate people, you're alienating your community, and you are not going to be as strong as you are when you work together. We did get a PEIA task force, and um, initially there wasn't uh, a single woman or a single teacher on the committee. And we fought that, and, and now we have a greater representation of our communities. And we went from having just a handful of meetings across the entire state to having ones that every single person could get to within a 45 minute drive. And, and we pushed those things by saying, this is important. You, you know, we, we went back with the, the pay raise signed in and the understanding that we're gonna get our health care fixed for everyone. And so those, um, those PEIA hearings are, are almost complete. They're going to finish up next week. This is what are your next steps and why is the next question. Um, we, we are beginning. You know, we, you learn by doing. And so the first thing that we did is we made sure that we told people how important it was to show up at those PEIA task force hearings, to live stream them, to ask hard questions about revenue, about how that healthcare decisions were made, if they were, um, if there were HIPAA violations because non-medical staff was making medical decisions. You know, we, we made sure that we, we put a document on our Facebook page and said, here are some, uh, some, in, some information and here's some revenue sources and here's data. Please use this to support your, your questions, your concerns. And um, we also created a petition about cre increasing the gas severance tax and about taking the uh, corporate business tax to what it was and about how much money that could raise and use data to support that. So we tried to make sure that there was representation in every single meeting. We've also had our first in-person um, West Virginia public employees meeting. We had that um, a, a few weeks ago and it was quite successful for the first meeting. We had people that were pipe fitters, um, healthcare workers, friendly legislators, teachers, bus drivers, retired, current, and they were from all over the state to be top to the bottom. And even though that we were a relatively small group, I think we had somewhere around 30 people. That was still 30 voices that were able to communicate in person and that will hopefully continue the conversation and encourage more people. We made everything very transparent. We let our unions know what we were going to do, that we were not trying to replace them, but and they were welcome to come, but they did not have a, a, a voice in it. They could be they could speak like everyone else, but they were not in charge because we didn't want to promote one organization over the other. And we have people from or, multi organizations and no organization that participate in this. So you know we are we are trying we are trying to, to keep up that conversation with everyone that we possibly can. We're trying to keep up the communication, setting goals for action. And we are trying to spread ideas and, and let people come up with their own ideas and, and take those back to their communities and work outside, inside, and alongside their organizations. Okay, the last one is um, what lessons did you learn that could be applied in California and elsewhere? Um, I would suggest to California that something that worked for us, and I know that we have a vastly different population and that you have bargaining rights, is I would direct some of your action toward the state as well. The state... And I'm, I'm hoping my numbers are correct, but I think in California 90% of district funds come from the state. And so if you need better classroom conditions, more funding, all of those things, then as the rank and file, you can go, 
you can get together and go to your state and demand that. That can be your umbrella that your districts fall under. You, they can set at least a minimum standard. And, you know, please don't forget to reach out to everyone. You're classified and you're certified. We need to view ourselves as educators, even though that we're educated, that we are working class. So please make sure that you reach out to everyone.